Yay! That's our newest member of the Kettle River. Belonging to Jenny Folsell. So, you know, I always have to It's cute. We need, we need more of those, by the way, if you guys are in the mood. Christina Lane would be really happy about that. You get your grants by numbers. So, welcome. I am Grace McGregor. I'm part of your facilitation today. The other one here is Brenda LaCroix. Brenda is the stewardship. And I will also introduce Peter Bowen. Peter, can you stand up, please? He is the uh, president of the stewardship. And, and the reason these guys are the reason this all gets put together. So, what we're going to do is a really fast go around. Uh, please, just your name and your affiliate. Uh, if you're just observing, perfect. We'd love to have you observing, so just say you're here to observe. And we are going to start here. With you. Okay, did you hear that? No. Stand up, stand up. I'm Kara Adrian, a master's student working on the No Foil Weevil project. I'm her mother. I'm a friend. Chair Wires, uh, Ground Force Environment Committee. Louis George, resident observer. I'm Tara Moody. I'm part of the stewardship, mem a member of the stewardship, and I'm on your Area C Area Planning Committee. Perfect. Thank you. Right, you need the mic to speak at the back. Hi, I'm Ian Robbins. I'm a resident of Christina Lake and director on, on the uh, board of the Stewardship Society. I'm Jay Elvis, resident of Christina Lake, uh, Community Futures Boundary representing, and I'm also very observant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Cindy Elvis, observer and resident here. And homecoming person. <laughs> I'm Sam Jackson, uh, representing the senior gateway. Uh -huh, you thought you were going to miss it. I'm gonna... Mary Bird, director of uh, stewardship and resident. Great. Great walk for me here to cover the watch and measure plan for here to TV. Uh, Phil Mackey, uh, according to my tag, it says I'm the uh, Eurasian Water Milk Oil Dive Crew Supervisor. <laughs> John Allen, no photo. Susan Harris says I am Christine Lake, Christine Lake Stewardship Director and Secretary. Okay, we'll put her back and then we'll go over here. Trevor Mill, Clive, sorry. I'm Tom Dean, and I'm the Provisional District of Community Boundary. Don Thompson, resident. Mel Carroll, member of the Society and uh, observer of the Grand Forks Wildlife Association. Mary Slicer, resident and member of the Stewardship. Linda Tucker, member of the Stewardship. I'm Bob Ellis, <laughs> resident. Larry Trey of two hats today, Sion Improvement Water District, and a member of at large Kettle River Watershed. Diana Carr for Phoenix Foundation. Raleigh Russell, director for Area and D, uh, RDKD. Hi, I'm Georgie Norris. I'm Lily Ground Forks. I'm Christina Lake from Summertime, and I'm re representing Christina Lake Campers Limited. And I'm an observer. Sandy Hall, and I'm an observer. Perfect. Liz Stewart, I live at the Lake and I'm an observer. I'm Ken Stewart. Uh, I'm on the uh, board of the Water District here. Michael Zimmer, aquatic biologist, Open Logging National Alliance, resident of Van Forks here in Zurich. Sharon Chuck, resident of Christina Lake, Observing. Tana Stevenson, waterfront property owner, member of the Christina Lake Arts and Arts and Society, and the Christina Lake of Carrie's Open. Oh, yes, and a member of stewardship. Hi, I'm Jolie Leggett from the Ministry of Environment, and also my water body biologist. I'm Shay Wolver from the Caldwell Tribes in the state, and I'm here observing. Father Joseph, Caldwell Tribes. I'm here observing. Sandy Martin, community coordinator for Christina Gateway. Dave Durant, area C, APC. 
George Hazley, a German resident of Christina Lake. Sally Hazley, resident and observant. Jacqueline Massard, resident. Wendy Phelan, resident. Bob, Bob Freeman with the waterfront property owners. Are you correct? <laughs> Kathy Manley, I'm with David Duran, the co-manager of the West Water User Community, uh, and I'm the Kettle River, and I was on the Kettle River Walk Management Plan Advisory Committee. Right, and that's my second thing you want me to say. Yes, I'll fill in where I think you guys are. Robin Hawkins, observer, and we live on the Kettle. Down in the and I'm a forester with Danny Cloudcherry, I'm a forester. Very recall, Christine Lee. Hi, I'm Ed Bockhart from Beaverdale. I'm the area E chairman of the Advisory Planning Commission. Uh, I sit on the Advisory Planning Commission for the water, Kettle River Watershed, and I'm the regional director of the British Columbia Snowmobile Federation. <laughs> Laura Ronigan, observer. Uh, Mark Anderson with the regional district of Cookie Down. Carol Bowen with the stewardship. Peter Bowen, president of Christian Lake Stewardship Society. And property owner of Christian Lake. Brian Brewer, president. Ray Hanson, the director on the stewardship and book access. Scott Corsellius, director of stewardship society. Jenny Colso with the Grand Wilderness Society. Daryl Concia. <laughs> Bart Stewart with the Boundary Invasive Species Society. I'm also a director on the Christian Life Stewardship Society. Katie Webster, conservation officer uh, based on Grand Forks with the Minister of the Environment. Dennis Crowich, Operations Manager of Ministry of Transportation for Grand Forks. Stephanie Gillis, Ms. Halper. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Gates, Christina Gateway. Alan Stanley, Regional District Community Boundary. Brent McCroy, Christine Lake Stewardship Society, Boundary Habitat Stewards, Kettle River Watershed Management Plan, and the Advisory Planning Commission. Other lane, uh, stewardship society. My good baby, Christina Gateway. Uh oh, found you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Daryl Arsenault. Um, I'm representing Big White on, on the Keller Garage Management Plan process. I work for Boulder Associates and uh, Fisheries Mile. Eva Anthony with the Grand View Wilderness Society. And I'm Patty Davidson with Golden Fitness. I'm a Patty Geologist. Okie dokie. We've got a really good room of people and we're excited about that. So thank you very much for joining us. So I'm not going to take any more time. I'm going to do a few things. Lunch uh, will be provided, of course. And there will be coffee and goodies that are already out there, which I've already sampled, and they're terrific. And so I'm going to go forward introducing Brenda LaCroix. And I'm going to let her do the rest of what she does uh, best, which is tell you exactly what they are doing. So, Brenda. Welcome, everybody. It's really good to see everybody. What a big group is here. Oh, not coming through at all. Hold on. Is that working a little better? Yes. Is that better? Volume up there? No. No, no, no. No test volume, so everybody can hear me okay? No. no. How's that? Yeah. Is that better? That's better. Okay. Closer? <laughs> okay. All right. I don't know how to talk like this the whole time. <laughs> okay, so welcome. And just a lovely picture of the lake. And Ryan jumping down to the potholes, the hot stuff to do in the summer for the younger people. Um, next slide. 
Uh, most people know this, but for the newbies that are here, I go through a little bit of stuff about Christina Lake. It is in the Kettle River Watershed Group. The, our drainage basin area is 519 square kilometers. We have 42 tributaries. Our lake fresh, a flushing rate is four and a half years, and we have one outflow of Christina Creek. Uh, Christina Lake is 18.7 kilometers long, average width is 600 meters. Uh, elevation at sea level is 446.7 meters, and the natural boundary is a little bit different. Um, okay, um, max depth is 54 meters. That's the big dark spot you see on the map. Average water temperature in the summer in August is 25 Celsius. Unbelievable. Um, bottom layer of the lake maintains um, a, a temperature of about 6 Celsius at greater than 20 meters. And it is a nutrient poor lake, but South End, and you'll probably notice that with all the plants, that it's starting to go a little bit eutrophic, and that just means it's a, a higher nutrient level on the South End. Okay. Um, we have a lot of fish species in our lake. 19 of those species have been confirmed. 13 of those species have been introduced, also via government stocking in the early 1900s. 14 unconfirmed fish occur in Christina Creek and the Kettle River and probably do occur in the lake that has not been confirmed. Uh, stocking occurred from 1901 to 1963, so that gives us a total of 33 fish. Uh, wildlife, we have a very uh, diverse wildlife population here. 72 common breeding birds, 33 migratory birds, 40 non-breeding visiting birds, Six reptiles, ten amphibians approximately, and 39 mammals. About the stewardship, we're a nonprofit organization, and we rely on partnerships, long-term uh, commitments from various levels of uh, all levels of government. Uh, we rely on our directors and our members and the volunteers and businesses and of course staff and students. And we go for project-specific funding as well as core funding. And uh, Here's the people, the girls that uh, did all the work this summer. Um, Heather Lane, up in the front there, has been uh, just fabulous. Can't say enough good things about Heather. So she's our senior stewardship assistant. And Jade Mullaney was our summer student. And Jade did a great job, and she's back at McGill University for that. Um, Barb's student, Ashley Lawrence, and that's Don Lawrence's granddaughter. Um, for those of you that know Dawn. Um, oh, and she helped with her aquatic invasive species. And most of you saw that banner up on the highway that goes, turns down at East Side. And thanks to Stephanie and Emcon for putting that up for us. Um, so we're getting into what are the categories of the watershed management plan? Just, that we, just to correct you, Stephanie, not the Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I said thank you, Stephanie, because she got Nam Khan to do it. And Nam Khan, thank you for that correction. No yes. worries. Sorry, sorry. I thought you might want that. To okay. Yeah. yeah. That's just yeah. the manual thing for you, Brenda. Uh, yeah, I hope so. Yeah, because it was really noticed up there. Okay. So the six categories that we've uh, developed in the Washington Plan are water quality, non-native invasive species, fishery sustainability, forestry practices, wildlife values, and shoreline and stream bank enhancement. Each one of these categories has several subsections to help us quantify level of concern and to manage all of them. There is a lot. It's a 12-page document of action items for the watershed plan, and it keeps on building. Okay. Oh, sorry, go back for a minute. At the end of the day, our last thing that we're going to be doing is an open forum, and we're going to be going into teams. And you guys are going to help us with some of the action items as teams and report on what uh, you value, uh, what your value is, what your priority is. And help us out so we get some input from you guys for the next three years for our planning processes. Okay. Um, so we broke all these things up to better try to figure out what we're doing with everything. Um, so we have core operation initiatives, which is the nucleus of all our operations. So that's our office and interpretive gallery. We have public education and community involvement, involvement initiatives. And then we have our monitoring programs and field projects. And this includes water quality, fisheries, and wildlife. Okay. So core operation initiatives. Uh, there's another thing. So that funds the stewardship center, and we have now confirmed that we have our funding for core operations for 2015. But as I say, as I say to everybody, every year it is a concern about getting funding. It's getting tougher, especially you know in the environmental sector. Um, wish list still is I would love to see 
um, an environmental trust for the boundary region for the NGOs that are trying to do the work in the environment. We really need something that can help make it sustainable. Um, our interpretive <coughs> gallery uh, has an interactive video display, display public access to information. Um, we assist in liaison with the environmental queries. We house reports, maps, data, best management practices. We have a resource library. We do public education. Uh, we have great staff here with local knowledge and ex uh, experience and the directors as well. Uh, professional field staff and community uh, participation. Uh, getting the word out there. Education is the key for most things. And so we're on Facebook, we're on YouTube. We work with other NGOs, uh, we liaison among groups uh, and businesses. We uh, involve ourselves in other working groups and committees. We do mail outs, we do email, we do uh, a lot of public displays and change over the current uh, activities and initiatives uh, in our interpretive gallery public menu. We also have kiosks in several locations with great signage that uh, educate people on what we're doing in the area and what uh, concerns are and what, where we need to protect. So we have one in Santa Creek, which is showing, and we have one in Texas Creek, we have one in the Nature Park, and we have one at the RDK Boat Launch. And these are some of the educational bulletins that uh, were mass produced that we hand out that are student specific. Okay, got a double click. So this is great. This is, we're still working on our underwater world, for those that you remember this from last year with the plants, which is so awesome. We've got 20 more plants. So we only have 15 left to go of the 55. So we're still working on compiling the 20 new plants onto the documentary. It's not done yet. But this is just a little blurb of the fish. This, those are little days. And then, I don't know if you can speak this up. Oh, and then pumpkin seed sunfish. Can you speak up a little bit? I want them to see the big carp. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this is at the north end. And so it's funny, it's mostly the here Oh, here it comes. There's, yeah. It's mostly the introduced species that have no, they're not shy. You don't see rainbow trout or coping, they don't go near you. So, okay, and then this other one is our critter cam. Thank you to Phoenix for um, helping us out with that. And these are baby foxes, they're not coyotes. They're very similar looking when they're pups. So aren't they cute? Anyway, so we've got elk, deer, coyote, fox, and raccoon. But we would like to report otter, black bear, grizzly bear, cougar, bobcat, and lynx. So if anybody has a spot, that we can secure a couple of critter cams, that would be great. Oh, that, that pond looks very big, it's still the one on the pond. Yeah. <laughs> 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 just right, just right, right. <laughs> okay, uh, so we're going to do Wild Safe BC at our office, and Dave's going to be talking about Wild Safe and Bearware, aka Bearware. Um, so this is helping people to reduce human wildlife conflict. We take a holistic view about living with wildlife in our own backyard. And we focus on all types, not just bears, it's cougars, coyotes, deer, raccoons, and things like that. And this is the bear that was up the tree, Dave, remember? Yep. My uh, was there, demo. Right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. When we were there, when we got a call, we were like, Ghostbusters, bear busters, yeah. So we have got that picture, and Dave will be talking more about that, and issues in the watershed enforcement issues. Uh, we also deal with species at risk, monitoring, reporting, and protection. So that's a rubber boa, tiger salamander, western skink, and a, a western rattlesnake. And oh, 105 plants. There's just a ton of species at risk in our, our region. Okay, uh, the young stewards of the boundary. You can get more information from Heather. We do have handouts for next year. And these are just some of the programs that we do for them. Okay. Uh, Don Guido's not here because she's at a dentist appointment, but she's supposed to be speaking in the afternoon regarding forestry uh, activities in the watershed, monitoring programs and field projects. Leo is our new water quality guy, and he also does the phytoplankton haul for their uh, aquatic invasive species program. And he never takes his hat off, so you may recognize the dogs. Um, that's Pirate Raider. Uh, Dave Beattie and Ben Brewer did this for over a decade, and they finally retired, and I thank them all the time at the JPF. Yeah, this is going to be talking about the uh, water quality sampling results for this year. Uh, Coconut Stream and Shore Spawners. We finally had another acoustical survey happen in November. I got calls. They never told me about it. I got calls. There's a fish boat on Christina Lake. Who's that? Oh, they're commercial fishery. Anyway, so 
This is actually the Crystal survey. The net was out there getting samples. So we should have the results by late winter. We have short spawners, stream spawners, stream spawners spawn in August, September, short spawners December through January, even though we did find spawning kokanee after ice off in uh, March that had eggs in them. So we don't know if it's a different genetic stock. Um, reds are mapped, were mapped annually. Um, there aren't any more while the reds have been mapped and they're very nocturnal, so we couldn't do proper inventory counts. That's, that's the acoustical surveys that occur. Um, stream spawners from DNA studies are from Kootenai Lake historical stocking. We don't have true stream spawning coping here. The only genetically sound, I guess is a word for it, true native species left in our lake is the short spawning coping. Rainbow trout has been hybridized by nine different stocking uh, pools and things like that. Um, short spawners do not turn red. Um, and there was a historical coconut fishery from 1898 to 1962 with approximately 42 metric tons hauled in over those years. Um, welcome Colville Tribes representatives, thank you for coming. And uh, Colville um, Fish and Wildlife Department is going to be doing some research on our shore and stream spawners and hopefully we can also look at the stuff below Cascade Cove because the bigger uh, sockeye or coconut there. Okay, uh, here's our numbers. <coughs> Sanders Creek came in the highest count ever this year at 15,250. Oh, sorry. That's right. Oh, no, what's this higher for? Okay, no, sorry, 12. I thought I was thinking about 2012. Sorry, confusion. So, yes, it is the highest. Um, Sander and Cree are just starting to come back. They've been really suffering. A lot of that's drought and infilling. So, 108. McCray, which is good because it went to zero after that blow of 2006 where it infilled the whole creek and you saw the big plume come out. And uh, Sutherland had 60. Here's the diagrams underwater. Alan's down will be presenting a summary of the milfoil and you can also uh, ask questions of Phil. Okay. Uh, we're still doing the North Bay uh, Boy Project and it's uh, thank you to the divers for putting those in and taking them out every year. Um, the newest proposal is, um, has been submitted for a, a riparian wetland demonstration site in the nature park. Also um, building a native plant nursery that we can actually use those plants to do the park and provide people with native plants in their own yards. <coughs> uh, that's just uh, the plots on the bottom. We change those up a little bit. Also we want to produce uh, like a nature scaping book. So people can go through their free soil types and slope and aspect and plant the correct plants on in your property. Uh, Aquatic invasive species program will be discussed in detail by Heather Lane. <coughs> and exciting news, um, we're going to have a documentary, Christine Lake is going to be included in that doc, doc documentary uh, regarding the aquatic invasive mussels. And they're going to be coming here in the December, sometime in January, and be interviewing a key people and filming and finding out about our program here. So that's very, very exciting. And thank you for everybody that actually donated. Okay, I won't say anything <laughs> about this, if you want me to. Sure. Sure. Uh, is it area C? Yeah. $1,000. Can you donate? The property owners decided two fifty, and stewardship uh, from donations from the directors, $500 towards this documentary. Um, Boundary Basis Species Society will be, uh, where we'll be talking about education, inventory, treatment, and monitoring. Uh, also, along with some updates regarding uh, legislation, right? Stuff like that? Okay. <coughs> Ground what? Hit the speaker up above. It's not going to work. It's supposed to be clapping to the gentleman for watching and so the top ground will be discussing that just before lunch. And here's Candace, Jack, and Jenny. <laughs> and uh, Jenny's going to be talking about the Kettle River right here in the Threat Assessment Project. And that's Candace's first bear road picture. And that's the bear. <laughs> uh, Peter Bowen loading up, uh, or unloading his boat and some styrofoam and stuff that's still coming out of the lake. Thank you to Peter and the volunteers that remove all of that stuff Great on job. the lake. Tons and tons. Okay. The 
this is a painting by my son Dustin. <laughs> I had to throw that in. I'm trying to get him to do more paintings like this. I think he'd make money here. But anyway, uh, that's some other talking. Um, so this is the people that we have to thank, and there's a lot, so I'll just read through. This is BC government, you know, and everybody's involved in that. Um, regional district, federal government, First Nations help, and this is not over the last 14 years, including everybody. Okay. And this is nonprofits, and there's a lot, and a couple of these groups no longer exist, which is really sad, like Living by Water, um, but the publications are still out there. And Boundary Bases and the Stewardship Center BC, BC Lake Steward, the uh, Phoenix Foundation, getting a little bit clouds in there, Mountain Equipment Co op, TD Friends of the Environment, Real Estate Foundation, BC Association of Charitable Game, Grandview Wilderness Society, Pacific Street Keepers, and we have colleges and universities, South Kirk University of BC Okanagan, and Portland State University. So a lot of support. It takes a lot of support to do this watershed. Okay. Thanks to the volunteers for everything that they do. Um, this year so far, we haven't completed our in-kind contributions because it's a lot of paperwork. Um, we're at $119,000 value in volunteer hours alone. Okay. Oh, we missed the, there, the end. <laughs> we have Jane and Heather. And if you have any questions or concerns, give us a call. And one more. And there's our contact information. Okay, thank you. Again, we can tell how much work goes into the stewardship and how many people are involved to make that happen. And you know, I'm happy to say that the stewardship of directors have grown and members have grown. And really, that's what that's what makes things work. Thanks again. Okay, so our next presenter is Jolene Rigett, and she's going to talk about she's an environmental impact biologist. Uh, for the Protection Division, Environmental Protection Division. She's going to talk about the Water Quality Review. So please help me welcome Joni. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, come today. Um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Joey Knight. I work for BC Ministry of Environment out of Nelson. I'm a water quality biologist. Um, I'm going to present today on the data that's been collected by Mike Sokol and Danny Taylor um, from the Penticton office, as well as data collected by the uh, Stewardship Society on the lake just in the last year. Um, just for context, Christina Lake is one lake uh, that's part of a network of uh, monitoring lakes in the Okanagan area. Um, it includes um, Okanagan Lake, Skaha, Wood, Kalamalka, Asoyas, Ellison, Maple Lake, Mara Lake, and Sugar Lake. Uh, these lakes are all monitored uh, by the Ministry of Environment in the spring and the fall as well. Um, and we collect uh, similar information as we do at Christina Lake, and I'll get into more details on what we do here. Um, Brenda already gave a bit of background on Christina Lake, and my numbers are a little bit different than hers, but um, Christina Lake drains an area of, I'm not touching it, okay, about 500 square kilometers and discharges uh, through Christina Creek down to the Kettle River, uh, flushes about every four and a half years. Uh, it's a dynamic lake, which means the water turns over uh, in the spring and the fall, and the lake stratifies in the summer. Um, <coughs> There are water licenses on the lake for domestic use, and uh, it's popular in the summertime for recreation. Um, there aren't any point source discharges to the lake, but there are non-point sources from septic system, agriculture, and forestry activities around the lake. Uh, overall, the historic data has shown that Christina Lake is a lagotropic, which means it's low in nutrients, uh, and the water quality is really good. I skipped this slide. 
Okay. Anyway, I'll just carry on. So maybe all oh, of this is left. Okay. So if it jumps ahead, and I don't know this, please let me know. So the uh, the Christina Lake sampling includes two sites. So there's one in the North Basin. Uh, this is our deep site. Uh, it's approximately 51 meters deep, and it's been sampled since 1991. There's a shallow site located in the southern end, uh, which is 26 meters deep. And there's quite a long history of data from this site. Uh, it's been sampled since 1972. The Ministry of Environment conducts our sampling twice per year, so we do sampling in the early spring after the ice melts. Um, and this is before the nutrient is taken up by plankton and before the water stratifies um, as the sun heats the surface layer. We also collect samples in the fall uh, when the nutrients in the surface layers have been used up by plankton um, and when decomposition of the sinking organic matter starts to occur and dissolved oxygen becomes uh, lower in the bottom layers of the lake. The uh, Christina Lake Sewerage Society samples uh, every, approximately every two weeks throughout the spring and the summer, so they fill uh, large uh, data gap that we're not able to come out and sample during that time period. So the Christina Lake Stewardship Society sampling includes at both sites temperature profiles as well as SECI depth measurements. Uh, the ministry sampling uh, at those sites includes uh, profiles for dissolved oxygen, temperature, and chlorophyll A. Um, as well, we collect water samples near the surface uh, in the epilimium, which is at a depth of less than 10 meters, as well as in the hypolimium, uh, depth greater than 20 meters. Uh, and these samples are analyzed for nutrients, uh, so different forms of phosphorus and nitrogen, uh, as well as ions, chlorophyll A. And in the spring, there's extra samples, uh, extra parameters are analyzed, including hardness, um, bromide, chloride, sulfate, calcium, and magnesium. So today I'm going to present uh, results from five key parameters that we um, sample for. So these include total nitrogen, total phosphorus, chlorophyll A, uh, secchi depth, and dissolved oxygen. Um, these parameters are all linked and are really important for evaluating lake status. Um, so as total phosphorus increases in a lake, you can get increases in phytoplankton, which is measured by um, chlorophyll A. Uh, the higher productivity you have in a lake, so the more phytoplankton you have, um, the less water clarity you have, so the second depth becomes shallower. Um, and the more productivity you have, you also have higher um, decomposition in the bottom water, so the dissolved oxygen levels can decrease. Uh, so the first parameter I'm going to talk about is total nitrogen. Um, it's not a limiting nutrient in Christina Lake, but it's important for determining water quality. Um, so there's different sources of nitrogen uh, that can include atmospheric deposition, septic leachate, agriculture, and fertilizer use. So we have a water quality objective, and that's the slide that I skipped. So water quality objectives are actually um, site-specific targets that were developed for Christina Lake in 1994 by the ministry. So they set um, what are considered safe levels for different parameters in the lake, um, so for different water uses, so safe levels for uh, domestic consumption, for recreation, and also to protect aquatic life. Uh, so for total nitrogen, um, the water quality objective is two micrograms per liter during spring overturn. So when we look at the data, you can see uh, the water quality at both sites uh, is pretty similar. Um, so you can see the the red and blue dots represent um, less than 10 meters, so that's the surface water, and greater than 20 meters. Um, if data from both sites shows total nitrogen has pretty much been the same since modern began. There's not any obvious trends or decreases in water quality, and every measurement has been below the water quality objective. Uh, the next nutrient is total phosphorus, um, which is a, an important nutrient. It's a limiting, limiting nutrient in Christina Lake, um, and it's used by phytoplankton for the, the floating algae. Um, increases in phosphorus can lead to increased algal production, reduced water quality, um, water clarity, and it can also create undesirable conditions for drinking water, recreation, and fish. Um, phosphorus levels are influenced by natural activities in the watershed, uh, as well as human activities. 
So the water quality objectives that were developed in 1994 did a review of total phosphorus loading to Christina Lake. Um, and that determined that about half of the phosphorus in Christina Lake uh, comes from water from the watershed. So through natural erosion, forest harvesting, or agriculture. About a third comes from human settlements and the associated wastewater. Uh, and 20% comes from precipitation and uh, atmospheric deposition. Those load estimates were calculated in 1994, so they're probably a little bit out of date considering um, the development that has uh, gone on around the lake. So we use spring overturn data for total phosphorus to determine trophic state of the lake. Um, we have uh, at the north site about 20 years of data, the south site over 40 years of data. Um, so these graphs show the total phosphorus during the spring overturn. Um, what you see looking at the graphs is the concentrations are similar at both the north site and the south site. Um, what I found interesting in going through the data uh, was you can, you can start to see a trend. So the phosphorus levels kind of go up and then they go down and then they go up and down. Um, I spoke with Mike Sokol, who's the um, water quality biologist in particular about this. And he had uh, said that this trend has actually been seen in a bunch of Okanagan lakes, and it's um, associated with uh, about every 10 years of cycles of wet and dry weather. And so during the wet years, you have higher spring runoff, which brings more phosphorus into the lake. Um, so those peak, the peaks of phosphorus are associated with wet years. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, so the water quality objective for total phosphorus is shown on the uh, the graphs in the green line, it's seven micrograms per liter. Uh, it's been met in recent years, but it is exceeded in years where you're having those wet years where you've got increased runoff in the spring. Uh, so next, uh, I'll talk about uh, phytoplankton chlorophyll A. So the productivity in a lake is measured uh, directly using um, chlorophyll A, which is the photosynthetic pigment present in uh, algae. Um, generally, when you have high levels of chlorophyll A, it's correlated with high levels of total phosphorus. Um, when you look at the results again, you see similar levels at the north site and the south site. Um, the water quality objective is shown with the green line there, and it's uh, 2.5 micrograms per liter during the growing season. So that's once the ice melts between April and then through to October. Um, most of the values, um, looking at the data, are below the water quality objective, except in the 1990s, and that's when we saw the elevated total phosphorus uh, during the wet period. Um, there's also one measurement of the south site uh, in 2014 that exceeded the water quality objective. Um, that wasn't correlated with a high total phosphorus, so I'm not sure why we saw such high chlorophyll at that site this year. But it does fall within the range that we've seen in the past, so it's um, not of concern at this point. Um, the ministry only collects uh, samples in the spring and the fall. The water quality objective is usually calculated using monthly samples. So for years where we actually had more robust data, um, calculated an average concentration, and you can see that here between 1991, 92, 94, 2006, and 2011. So those are years where we have monthly chlorophyll A data. Um, those years were all um, less than the water quality objective. So this uh, this slide talks about SECI depth. So SECI depth is a measurement of the transparency of water. So it can be affected by dissolved or particulate matter that's present in the water column. Uh, it's measured using a black and white <coughs> disc, which is I think it's 20 centimeters in diameter, and you lower it over the side of the boat uh, and see where you, you can't see it anymore, and that's considered the second depth. Um, this graph shows I've flooded both the Ministry of Environment and the Stewardship Society's data, so we do the spring and the fall, um, and then the, the remaining data in the middle of the is all collected by the Stewardship Society. Um, generally, as the season progresses, you can see an increase in sunlight nutrients, which promotes algal growth. So you can see between our sample and the first sample collected by the Stewardship Society, there's an increase uh, or a decrease in second depth. Um, and then as zooplankton numbers increase, they start grazing on the phytoplankton, 
which increases the water clarity. So then the psychic depth becomes deeper again throughout the spring and summer. <coughs> Um, the data from both sites is pretty similar, um, and the average uh, the average calculated for 2014 is actually slightly less than the water quality objective, but it's pretty close. Uh, 9.6. The water quality objective is 10 meters and deeper, uh, and it falls within the range that's been seen in, in past years. So these figures show uh, temperature profiles taken from the lake. Uh, again, most of the data shown on these charts is collected by the Stewardship Society. Um, in the spring, when the ice melts, the lake temperature is fairly uniform, and you can see that by the line on the left side of each of the graphs. Um, so the lake is fairly well mixed, and the temperature is fairly consistent from top to bottom. Uh, as the sun warms the water, the colder, denser water sinks. So the temperature of the water affects the density. So uh, the cold water starts to sink and the surface waters become hot. The layer is called epilimnium. It's fairly well mixed water. Uh, below the epilimnium, there's um, a transitional layer that's called the metalimnium. Um, the boundary between these two layers is called the thermocline. And that's the point at which the temperature begins to steadily decline. The bottom layer, which is more uniformly cold, and you can see that here. Um, it's called the hypolimnia, and it's typically around four to five degrees. Um, in 2014, the thermocline in Christina Lake, looking at the, the graphs, was between about six and 10 meters. Um, not surprisingly, peak temperatures were seen in August, uh, just over 25 degrees, which is higher than uh, has been recorded in the past few years. So it was pretty warm this summer. Uh, this figure shows the dissolved oxygen that's measured uh, at the north site in the fall. Um, so as with temperature in the spring, I'm not sure you can spring what graph, because basically the, the, wa the water is very well mixed with dissolved oxygen, basically just a straight line. Um, so this shows when the lake is stratified into the different layers. Um, so dissolved oxygen is typically high in the epilimnium because there's contact with the atmosphere and there's photosynthesis with the algae. Um, in Christina Lake, the light actually penetrates below the thermocline, and so you have photosynthesis below the thermocline. You have maximum uh, oxygen concentration, so you can see the line goes down, and then just below the thermocline, you get an increase in dissolved oxygen. Um, that's because there's the photosynthesis of the algae. They're also exposed to nutrients from the bottom of the lake, um, so they're very productive in that area. Uh, and then the dissolved oxygen starts to decline as you get near the bottom, and the very deep areas, the dissolved oxygen is actually really low. There was a water quality objective set um, for the lake of 8 milligrams per liter, and that's to protect uh, all life stages of fish, uh, I think, except for egg incubation. Uh, it's met pretty much uh, in all of the lake, except for the very deep water, where you've got the uh, organic material that's being broken down by the which reduces the amount of oxygen in the water. This shows uh, similar data. So this shows the dissolved oxygen from 2014. Uh, along with the chlorophyll A, which is the measure of productivity. So you can just see um, the, in the, just below the refine where you get the spike in chlorophyll A, as well as the spike in dissolved oxygen. So uh, overall, 2014, um, the data continues to show Christina Lake has good water quality. Um, there are no apparent trends indicating any changes to the lake related to activities in the watershed. When I compared the numbers to the water quality objectives that were set in 1994, uh, total phosphorus, total nitrogen both met the objective. Um, there was one chlorophyll A concentration at the south end of the lake that was elevated, um, wasn't correlated with increased in nutrients. So it's unclear why that was caused, but it did fall within the range seen in previous years. Um, Psyche depth was slightly less than the objective. Um, but it was pretty close, uh, and it was also within the range that's been observed in the past. Um, dissolved oxygen met the water quality objective in the lake, except for the very deep samples, um, which were quite low, but it's unlikely you're ever going to meet the water quality objective near the bottom of the lake. Uh, and it, that's what's been seen in the past. Um, so what's next? Um, 
we have a really good data set for Christina Lake. And uh, it's really interesting to start seeing some of the trends, particularly in the phosphorus with the increases uh, that are associated with the weather. Um, I think continued monitoring is important to understand the conditions, uh, as also, also to evaluate long-term trends, uh, potential changes related to climate. Um, currently, we're planning on continuing our monitoring uh, in the spring and the fall. And we support the Stewardship Society uh, in their efforts to continue doing the SECI depth uh, and the temperature profiles. Um, there is data, a robust data set that was collected in 2011 um, for the water quality objectives. It's called attainment monitoring. Um, that data has yet to be summarized um, and needs to be uh, reported. Um, so that's on my list of things to do. Uh, also, the water quality objectives were written in 1994. Um, I feel that they should probably be uh, reviewed and updated if necessary, considering the more recent data that's been collected in 2006 and 2011, as well as any new scientific information that's available. So I just want to say a big thank you to the Christina Lake Stewardship Society. Um, the data that has been collected by that group is really valuable um, and feels uh, you know, big gaps where the ministry is not able to kind of monitor during the summer. Um, if you're interested in more information on the Okanagan Lakes monitoring, there is information on the, the ministry website, the link is there. Um, and if you have any questions, my contact information is there as well. So thanks again for inviting me to speak, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Questions for Jolene. Now, you're doing your water quality sampling in the middle of the lake, and I'm wondering if you or IHA do water quality sampling at places where people swim. Uh, I don't know. I, like, I know when Nelson, the Interior Health, uh, does monitoring. They have some frequent monitoring at recreational beaches. And yeah, I don't have an answer for, for um, the lake here. Brendan? Okay, cool. Yeah. Right now, um, all the beaches, what's considered a beach has to have ownership. Uh, there's a volunteer program um, that's taking place. The only place that now has IHA uh, public health water sampling is the DUS area that's done by Kaloya, the part of the Boundary Bundle Parks. Um, the regional district was given a letter by IHA to see if they want to take on Kingsley and all that other stuff. But it's a volunteer program and they don't know how long they're going to continue it. Years ago, when we had Lorraine and Leslie, the, all the beaches were done weekly, and they were taking care of all that. Um, now it's not happening. So it's just the day's beach. So, uh, and Cheryl's not here to talk about that. So that's what's going on right now. So it's really declined for the, that kind of water quality sampling. Any more questions for Jolene? Thank you, Jolene. I, I was just gonna actually follow up that we, have, the ministry, when we do the, the ministry, when we do the uh, more detailed water quality objectives attainment monitoring, there is near shore sampling in those areas and the water is tested for coliforms, uh, as well as other parameters. Last round of sampling was done in 2011, though. So when you do that sampling, can that, could that also trigger a request that, that septic systems be examined, because, uh, checked because you're getting higher readings in particular areas? Um, we we might, based on the results, we might make some recommendations. Um, it's hard to kind of pinpoint where, you know, if you're going to get for coliforms, it's hard to pinpoint exactly where it's coming for, from. And, you know, I know there are septic systems all along the south end of the lake. Um, but, you know, we would make recommendations to, um, I guess it would be, I think who, who's in charge of health, the interior health or the regional district. Interior health. I noticed that your water quality sampling program is in three different watersheds uh, the Shushwap with the Mara and Mabel, and then uh, Okanagan, all the way from Ellison, all the way down through the uh, Soyuz. Is that correct? Yeah. Now, have you compared the watersheds? I see that Christina Lake is the only the one, the only one monitored within this watershed, but the other ones, are you comparing for trends and changes within yeah. Okanagan? Yeah, there, there has been data written up, and um, I don't have the slide up there anymore, but there is uh, information available on the ministry website summarizing um, the water quality data from the different Okanagan lakes. 
Um, so if you want, you can get in touch with me and I can send you that. Thank you. Any other questions? Perfect. Thank you so much. Very appreciate that. Good information. It's also our testimony that our lake is, is still in pretty dark on good shape considering the amount of people that use that piece of water. A couple of announcements you might be interested in. Les Johnson back there is the gentleman that set up the videos. We are now streaming live. So, Les, thank you very much. That also enables other people that can't be here to view this at a later date. And, and Les did a phenomenal job for us the last few years. So, it, it's really important that like boat access people, or people that live on the lake, have a chance to look at this information. So we're happy about that. The other thing, please note that Craig Lindsay over there is from the Gazette, and he uh, he's very interested in seeing this many people out, aren't you, Craig? Great, great turnout. Thank you. Okay, so our next presenter is uh, dear to my heart. <laughs> Better be anyway. <laughs> is the director of environmental services for the regional district of Cookie Boundary. He's going to talk to you about Millfoil. So happy <laughs> welcome, Alan Stanley. I think we all get the memo you have to be here to grace his heart, or you have to work somewhere else. So, <laughs> very simple. So, uh, I don't have any uh, slides to show you this, this year. We, we, we've uh, done really elaborate presentations in the past with videos showing the divers and, and whatnot. This year, um, most of what I have to talk about is uh, really doesn't lend itself very well to uh, to visuals. The biggest issue that we've got this year was staffing. Uh, if you remember, um, and I will uh, actually before I start, I'd like to thank Phil Mackey and uh, John Allen. Uh, those are our divers. We'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, uh, if you guys recall, uh, uh, young Andy Gilmore, who was an outstanding. Uh, uh, contributor to this program. He was uh, energetic and uh, well organized and did a fantastic job. Well, Andy, unfortunately, I got an email from him last winter um, that he had a great career opportunity and he was going to move on with much regret. So that was very sad for us because not only did we think Andy was doing a really good job from a professional standpoint, we really liked him as a, as a person. We thought Actually, we thought that he might have some uh, some potential to move within the organization as well. He's a super talented uh, young fellow. Um, when Andy pulled out, uh, uh, Chad Freeman was left uh, as as their senior guy in our crew, and he stepped up, um, brought, brought got the uh, got the program together. We got two dive crews on the on the lake uh, this year again. Um, a little bit diminished numbers from last year in terms of dive hours. Now, so uh, Chad was uh, doing doing well. It looked like things were going well for us. And uh, just towards the end of summer, I got an email from Chad saying that he had a fantastic educational opportunity, which he could not pass up. And that was great news for Chad, but again, it wasn't so great for us. And Chad was a fantastic uh, young man, uh, as, as we all know. Um, he was doing, I thought, thought, a good job, and he was really working his way into the, uh, into the, into the uh, supervisor role. So, <laughs> Mr. Mackey, Bill, uh, <laughs> and, uh, to, took it home, brought it home at the end of the year. So, which was great. Uh, kept the crew going, and we finished on October 18th. I think it was the last dive day. Uh, had a good, another good season. Two crews. Uh, we're running. I, I call it an eight-day-a-week program. Uh, we we use the uh, the two crew the two crews uh, share the dive boat, and then on the Thursdays uh, we have a set we have both crews on the lake, and they they've uh, coined this Super Thursday, and uh, they tackle some of the harder harder to manage spots, some of the more densely infested spots. So. Um, Partly the reason why I'm not presenting the data for this year's program is Mr. Freeman is going to be doing the, uh, the final report, which is not uh, not quite ready, and uh, and he's quite busy with this new educational opportunity, and he's uh, becoming Bob. You might be able to help me out with this. Radiology is got like medical school. It's 
it's a real big deal for Chad. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we pray for him and good luck to Chad in the future. So staffing has proven to be a bit of an issue. Uh, um, we've uh, I've talked I've had some preliminary discussions with Mr. Mackey about uh, possibly taking on the role of supervisor for next year. And he has uh, is not he's not uh, got back. But we'll we'll have those conversations. This time this time of year where we where we have those. Um, so so that's where we we are, and it's it's proven to be it's a seasonal job, and and, and we will uh, experience uh, challenges in trying to keep a uh, eight person crew. We've got some really great young people. We went through a couple of them. we had to do a couple of dismissals as we're trying to build this crew up and. Uh, it's it's been a it's been a, an interesting and challenging time for, for everybody involved. Um, one of the other things that came up this year is that uh, the regional district Kootenay Mountain across the board is expanding its uh, rigor in terms of safety and uh, compliance with all the all the various safety regulations. And uh, we've done some really comprehensive inspections in the boat this year. We will be. Spending some money to bring the boat up to the standards, Transport Canada, and other work safe BC standards. Um, not that we were terrible, but uh, we can be doing better. So, so that's where we uh, where we are with with the program. Uh, you know, within a couple of months, uh, Director McGregor Grace and, and I, and possibly Bill, will be sitting down and looking at what the program's going to look like for next year. Whether we're going to uh, keep the two crews going and so on and so forth. So. Um, that's where we are, just trying to keep uh, crews on the lake, keep them pulling leads, keep, you know, what we, what, what our mandate has always been in this program is put all the money, in, as much of the money as possible on the lake. Get the guys and women in, in the lake and, and pulling leads and spend the money on that. And that's what we've been concentrating on, so we'll, you know, we'll review those, those mandates and, uh, and uh, come up with a plan for the 2015 year. Now, one of the, 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 the things that we're going to talk about here uh, is the weevil. And I guess, great. Um, if, if we had a dollar for everybody that asked us about how the weevil's going, we could eliminate the tax requisition of this program. We could just throw it all down again. <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately, uh, we, the, we convened a meeting here a couple of years ago. In this room, we brought every scientist and regulator from senior levels of government that we could get a hold of that would come and had a great meeting, um, talked about what the process was to use a, use a biocontrol agent in the lake. Uh, we, you know, we, we actually challenged the, uh, the senior government people, the provincial and federal government people at the time and said, okay, we're trying to get this biocontrol agent proof for testing. In your experience, has a local government ever undertaken this? So these are people that this is their field. This is where they were in their whole careers. And to a person, they said, no, this is well beyond the scope that we've ever dealt with a local government before. So we are, we were in clearly in very deep water. Actually, no pun intended, but uh, we it was well beyond our, 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 our capacity, our scope of expertise. We're talking about biology. We're talking about invasive species and, and introduction, introduced species and whatnot. So out of that meeting came a couple of action steps. And one of the first action steps that we had was, um, before we could even go any further, we had to determine whether or not the weevil was a native species in the lake. And so the program, with the support of Dr. McGregor, um, hired some professional biologists and said we determined that yes, indeed, this weevil was in the lake. And to do that, just to give you an idea, of, even just to get that done, we brought in these biologists, they, they, they um, uh, scoured the lake, they found the uh, sample um, species or sample bugs, they preserved them in alcohol, we sent them to a provincial agency in Kamloops, who then sent them to a federal lab in Ottawa, who then uh, did DNA testing on them and determined that they were the target species. So we thought, okay, that's good. That's the first step before we could even, because now what we're, we're I guess the terms of inoculating the lake if, if, with, with an existing species. And that was a couple of years back. And we were assured by the regulators that they would, thanks for all your work and above and beyond the call of duty. And 
uh, we'll, we'll get right on this, we'll get right back to you. And, and then they couldn't get back to us because there was an election coming up. And then they couldn't get back to us for uh, mysterious reasons beyond our ability to understand. So we, we, we kept pestering them. And I have to say, Director McGregor has been, in terms of going above and beyond the call of duty, she has been knocking, literally knocking on doors of ministers. Every UBCM meeting, there is a request for a meeting with a minister, different ministers from different ministries. Uh, we're a bit of an overlap here. Uh, we deal with generally with the Ministry of Environment on most of our issues, but the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations is the ministry that's generally approves biocontrol agents. So it's been a bit of a labyrinth. And, and recently, as a result of the last UBCM meeting and some of the, the lack of uh, response we got from the province at that time, Grace started really hammering on doors and started talking to the local MLAs and they were asking us for all of our background papers and whatnot. And so I, I've been sending this stuff off into the ether and hoping that somebody's going to answer the question. And our, 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 our request these, this year was pretty modest. Yes or no? <laughs> answer three of the question. And if it's, if it's no, then fine. You know, we'll, we'll move, we'll carry on. If it's yes, then we'll, we'll sit back and figure out what we're going to do. Uh, you know, that modest request for just an answer where they are has not been, not been answered. Now, okay, the, the biologists, the scientists have a very good point. We're, we're not talking, there are a lot of examples of species that were introduced for a purpose. And, and Grace has the example of the, uh, the shrimp that killed the lane cod in, in, in Christina Lake. So it's not like their concerns are trivial or should be or it should be uh, minimized, but uh, but they have a lot of time with it, and and we're waiting. So um, you've got some news on that, so I'd love to pass this on. You can okay. tell people what the news is. <laughs> okay, thanks, Alan. Uh, I could tell stories on Melville for a long time, but I won't hold you up that long. So the, the latest, of course, at UPCM was we walk into the room, we sit down nicely, we're very polite, we're expecting ministers, blah, 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 blah. Um, and there's a bunch of people lined up, there's a bunch of bureaucrats lined up, no minister. All of a sudden, minister would be somewhere else, and we're going, okay, right? And we walk out. With us was Linda Larson's assistant. And I looked at her and I said, can you tell I'm pissed? She said, yeah. I said, does that mean somebody's going to do something about this? Because this is the same type of message as we got last year. She assured me they were going to. But I happened to be involved with a project called the Rural BC Project with Donna Barnett. And if you don't know Donna Barnett, get to know her. She is one pit bull. And I love the lady. So she is the Rural Secretary. So she said to me, we're up a drink. She says, what's, what's bugging you? I said, story, right? Oh my God, she said, you're kidding. I said, nope, not kidding. She said, send me the info. So we did, Ellen sent her everything. Ellen sent everybody everything. So uh, John McLean, a few months ago, got a call saying, we haven't lost it. We're, we're dealing with it. We understand you're a little upset. Two weeks ago, or a week and a half ago, I got another call from FLNRO, and the lady said to me, just talk to Donna Burnett, she says, you're a little ticked. I said, yeah, that's been a mild late. So she said, we will have an answer for you soon. It is now in the hands of FLNRO, so if you are sending letters, we have the proper name for them to go to. They should not go anywhere except to this one person, Donna said, Grace, please, some of these letters have been sitting in little offices somewhere because they were in the wrong ministry. How are we supposed to know that? I have no clue. But anyway, we now know it. So with Brenda has all that information. I sent it to her. So we'll share that with you if you're interested at all in writing a letter. And, and, and actually, um, Donna Burnett has sent all those letters forward to this one particular lady in Victoria. So maybe, just maybe, we'll get an answer, and I won't stand up here next year and tell you another 
story on meals. Um, there's certain people you send these letters if you're concerned about them getting action on the uh, milfoil weevil, stuff done. And then there's other people that you send if you want to send mussels, like the letter about the aquatic invasive species, okay? We have both. Yes, there is a difference. So whoever was at that meeting where we convened with the scientists and I showed the flow chart for the processes for some of these things, Dave was there. And uh, it was big, it was, uh, it was just meant for laughs, but it, it was just arrows going in every direction and not in, ending up anywhere. Uh, which, again, you know, local government has a very specific mandate, very specific, we work under legislative rules, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's what we do and how we do it is all very specific. What we do not do is we do not approve biocontrol agents and those kind of things. That is just beyond, that will always be beyond our scope. So we're, we're in, a, in, a, in a role where we're really just encouraging these people to actually spend some time and, and, and give us an answer. So that's really it. We will have our annual report as soon as it's ready. Uh, I will, we will be posted to our website. I will send them to, uh, an email to Brenda who can then distribute the link to, to anybody that's interested in reading it. And, uh, um, you know, so that's basically an overview of it. And if there's any questions uh, about the actual program on the lake, um, Mr. Mackey would be happy to answer those. Uh, and we might want to ask Kara if she has anything she'd like to say about the weevils. Kara. I do, and I actually have a, a poster set up in the back, so I would invite you guys to come over and talk to me during the break. Um, Karaoke. Thank you, Start singing. Okay, um, I have a poster set up uh, in the corner over here, so I would invite anyone to come over and, and talk to me during the break, so are there no questions about that? <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Kara. Are you are you done, Alan? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait. So I'll just, I'll just uh, uh, finish up here uh, very quickly. Um, you know, we've always, we've always appreciated the, the, the full-on engagement uh, of the residents of the lake with this issue. Uh, we had to make a couple of really difficult decisions a couple of years back. Uh, it was clear that we were losing ground with the single crew. We've been running that program for over 20 years, and we did some scientific analysis of that to, to predict that we would start losing ground. And, uh, there was the prediction turned out to be true, and uh, Grace uh, did a, what I consider a very bold move, uh, upping the budget, and basically standing in front of the, you folks and Christina Lake saying, I'm going to double the budget, we're going to put a second crew on the lake, and, uh, and generally the reports are that the second crew has been making a very positive impact, and, uh, and I would love to hear from anybody that has comments on it or anything like that. It's, uh, Terry. Hey. Um, for the benefit of some of the people who haven't attended previous meetings and these discussions, who uh, some of them have come to me to talk to me about the South End, could you just explain what the position has become on the South End in the last few years? So we're seeing why we're seeing what we're seeing at the South End. And, and I might ask Bill to, to step in on this one as well. Uh, so what had happened over the years was that the South End, it, it, it's, it's, it's much shallower, a bit longer, wider, literal area, it's shallower. It, uh, it, it's the general direction of the lake flow. It had, uh, the infestation had gotten very, very severe to the point where, um, well, one of the supervisors, and I actually was Andy, um, I said, well, what's going on in the South End? I'm getting a lot of complaints about the South End. He goes, you know, Al, we could go and spend our whole season in the South End, and nobody would even know we were there, and and all of the other stuff that we're actually making an impact on would not get done. So the South End was, you know, the word abandoned had been used. Um, now, with the second crew, there have been opportunities to take a hack at some of these, these, these places. This is where these Super Thursdays have come in, where they, they went into very, you know, very in, uh, densely infested areas and, and tried to work those out. So those are some of the decisions. And, and actually, the South End, you know, the question was, well, why are you, if you got the dive crew and if you do the weevils, we need to need the dive crew. And we always thought that uh, that the weevil would be very complementary to the to the actual physical removal. Um, 
in areas like the South End where it was so densely infested, where the weevil might be able to, to, to kick some of that back a little bit, to, um, you know, uh, more effectively, where, and the divers could continue to, to, to patrol the areas where they could actually make a difference. Does that make sense to you, Terry? Oh, yeah, it makes okay. sense to you. Okay. Question? Yeah, uh, last year you talked about your hope to explore the effectiveness <coughs> of planting native vegetation that would compete with the milfoil. No, that was these guys, no. Ah, okay. So I'll, I'll just put that that question on the table, and the right person can answer. They will. They will. Well, and, and, and just on that point, uh, you know, Barb Bar Stewart's here. She does the terrestrial program, and uh, you know, one of the basic tenets of that program is that uh, is that good land management. Uh, so if you're going to tear up, uh, disturb the soil, you put something that you want back in there, because if you don't something you don't want to go back in. So I think the same principle applies. Um, but uh, I would definitely defer to the other folks that have been working on that. Terry? Uh, first thing I'd like to thank the recent district for all the work they've done, it's particularly Grace. It might be of interest to you to know that the consulting firm from Barrow Science has got out of this business. They've shut down their office in uh, Ontario, and they've gotten completely out of the business of weevil because it has not been gone any farther. The patented rights for that is now up for sale, so you might want to keep that in mind. That is very interesting. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. McCauley. Uh, and this is one of the things that Kara was working on, because one of the things we were not going to do with the weevil was just go in blindly without some efficacy. Uh, studies to see, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, what, you know, it, it seems like a magic bullet, but, uh, you know, we also know that some of these magic bullets haven't worked. And what we sort of anecdotally had is that, uh, that it was a, you know, a repeating process. It wasn't just like a magic bullet, you drop the weevils in and then boom, you're done, that you would have to go back every two or three years. So I'm extremely interested in things like what you've just presented and Kara's studies on efficacy before we make any recommendations and spend any money on it. First of all, we don't know if we can do it. So this, at least this side issue with the in the background of trying to um, get permission to test it, test the weevil, has not cost us uh, you know, money. It's cost Grace a tremendous amount of time and, and me as well, but uh, but nothing that I'm, I'm building extra for or anything like that. So. <laughs> Right on. <laughs> Calm down, Anyways, that's that's about all I've got. Looking at times, we we got to keep this this program moving. And down. One of the things Grace and I will talk about if there's interest in in another session early in the year, focused on 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 milk oil, we will probably be more than happy to to uh, to accommodate that. Great Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it is now come time. Yay! So make sure you check out uh, Kara's display over here on, on her research because it's really, really interesting. And Kathy, uh, Heather will answer that question and then presentation after her after the conference.